So thank you very much. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Right, I feel really far away. <laughs> um, so uh, thanks so much for having me. Um, as Alan said, my name is Mary Connell. I'm the director of Ormston House, which is a cultural resource centre on Patrick Street, for those of you who don't know it. Uh, and it's run entirely on a voluntary basis by students and recent graduates of Limerick School of Art and Design. Um, so I'm going to let the slides uh, run. And it's, it's, you're going to see documentation of our program throughout National City of Culture last year in 2014. And in the five minutes, I'm going to try and answer three questions. First of all, who, who we are. Uh, second of all, what National City of Culture meant to us. And three, what work we propose to do between now and 2020. <coughs> uh, so I moved to work in 2009 um, to undertake a scholarship at the School of Art and Design. And all of my colleagues, without exception, advised me not to move to Limerick because of the lack of long-term prospects. Um, now, they don't feel, feel the same way, but at the time, this is the advice that I was given. Um, I'm going to skip forward to 2011, and I saw an opportunity, and I took it. Uh, I negotiated the use of an empty retail unit on Patrick Street, and I had one month to activate the space. I had no money, no staff, and no programme. In the first year alone, we received 300 applications. Uh, so in, uh, at the end of 2014, we had produced 31 exhibitions, worked with 26 curators, uh, 246 artists aged between, the ten, aged between 10 and 82. Uh, we had organized 10 residencies, 74 <coughs> events, worked with 83 organizations, uh, 24 staff members from transition year students to PhD candidates, and we had 600 members on our membership scheme. So that's just a little bit of kind of what we've kind of done over the last uh, four years. Um, so in four years, Ormson House has become a national model of best practice in artist-led initiatives, and we've been invited around the country and internationally to Stockholm, <coughs> Sofia, and Nottingham, and most recently to the University of the Basque Country in Bilbao, uh, and to Tobacco Lair, the International Contemporary Culture Centre in San Sebastian. Um, so, City of Culture was really a game changer for us. Uh, I see that there's a radical shift in the thinking around and the understanding of what culture and the arts in particular can contribute to civic life. And I like to think of Limerick as a city of firsts in Ireland. Uh, it's the first uh, place where something like the Creative Limerick Initiative um, was formed by the Planning <coughs> Department, uh, Eve International, Ireland's uh, first biennial of visual art. Uh, the Artists Living Quarter in St. John, John Square, which is subsidised um, accommodation, um, and the National City of Culture. I think a Limerick always works best when it listens to its own voice, when it kind of leads um, the, the way in thinking uh, around arts and culture. And I was struck by uh, Callum Lee, who spoke at the um, Visual Art Ecology Conference uh, this weekend, which is a conference which is part of the legacy um, and commissioning project for Limerick City of Culture. And he said in the research that they had conducted around Limerick, that actually uh, things that the local government here, the people were doing, were more interesting and cutting edge than what was happening at a central government level. Uh, and he had some quite extraordinary uh, statistics about how Limerick sort of leading the way in thinking around culture and the arts. Um, so I'm going to skip through, because I, I know I don't have much time left. So. Um, I want to get to what we would like to work on between now and 2020. So 2020 is something that we're all really striving for, we all really, really want, but it, we shouldn't see it as a target. There's a lot of work that needs to be done between now and then. So I would like to propose, um, uh, to present sort of a series of proposals that we would like to work on between now and then. Um, so the first is we want to secure our tenancy at uh, 9 to 10 Patrick Street. Um, we want to create a stable, secure, sustainable model of practice. Um, and we don't want to see what often happens with artist-led initiatives where there's a sort of a wave of people coming in, people burn out, the property gets used for commercial purposes. And we want to keep this site, uh, we want to keep this, this building. Um, and there is a precedent for this. I think of the Artist Space 220 in Providence in the United States. They started in 1985 with $800 in a room. Uh, by 1992, they had 1.2 million, and they bought their first property, which is over 20,000 square feet. It's really a, quite an extraordinary story. It's a group of people who came together, 
uh, quite similar to what we're doing at Ormston House. And you can see their story online, well, the official version of the story online. Uh, you can contact them for the unofficial version, which is far more interesting, where they actually took over derelict buildings and sites and started working on them. Um, and um, again, something that the Bristol Biennial guys were talking about undertook a little bit of, I wouldn't say criminal activity, but it certainly wasn't legal at the time. But now they have uh, three properties, and the downtown area that they first occupied, oh sure, okay. Sorry, I'm going to go really, really quickly. Um, the second uh, thing I'd like to propose is an artist welfare program, similar to the one that happens in Berlin. Um, and Berlin, as we know, there's like 50,000 artists working in Berlin. Um, it's considered a cultural center of, of the world. Uh, and I think to support artists um, in the city is really important. So I would propose a pilot scheme for an artist welfare program uh, with the local government. Uh, I also would like, I've been talking for about three years now about a grant writing agency that I'd like to set up over the next four years. Um, and I always think of something that Mike Fitzpatrick told me about at uh, Harvard University who have 700 full-time fundraisers on their staff. And if you look at the arts and cultural organisations around the country as far as I'm aware, a single institution actually has a full-time fundraiser or grant writer. Um, we'd also, we've uh, really would like to strengthen the European network of partnerships that we've started to develop. And lastly, I'll leave on this note, sorry, Alan, um, the normalization, sort of a fluid flow of conversation between arts, culture, business, politics, and to try and do away with an us and them kind of idea that we all are stakeholders um, in this process. We're all citizens of the city, we're all very proud of our city, and just to have that normalization that we're all talking to each other about this. Thank you.